think it's time to introduce you to our headline speaker, to speaker tonight, Mr. Washington Washira. Washington started his career um, all the way back when he was 14 years old. Uh, quite incredible. He gained recognition by winning a high school nature photography award uh, in 2009 and followed by, followed by numerous national and international accolades. His photography and articles are featured in books and magazines and projects from all over the world. And quite impressive, uh, he's a National Geographic uh, Explorer, and that was awarded to him for his work on crowned eagles uh, in Kenya. Washington also holds conservation awards, including the Daisy Rothschild Award, which he got in 2015. Uh, and he's a saf certified safari guide, founder of the Kenyatta University Bird Club, um, and he's engaged in various different research projects across East Africa. So he's quite um, a fay not only with the, the tourism side of, of raptors, uh, raptor conservation, but also the scientific side of raptor conservation. Washington also gave a TED talk. So he's a TED speaker and has and serves in, a div in diverse conservation groups and communities. With that, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce you all to Mr. Washington Wishira. Over to you, Washington. Um, so thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Kellen. Um, it's been an honor chatting with you earlier, as well as the rest of the team. So this evening, I'll uh, take 25 minutes to look into the world of uh, fish eating raptors um, and probably try and share a few ideas on um, different uh, species. Uh, it's not many species, to be honest. It's a small group. Uh, but basically, I'll be sharing some insights about the different groups. So this uh, beautiful bird you see here, most of you here are aware um, and have probably worked with different uh, eagles in Africa or owls in Africa. So this is the African uh, fish eagle, uh, which will be the first species we are going to look at. Um, the sound playing in the background is something we have all heard before, right? Um, this is iconic for all African movies, uh, African safaris. Uh, lodges, everything, yeah. So I'll pause it there uh, because I think everybody has been able to hear the African fish eagle sound. Uh, but I play that sound just to uh, mention something briefly, which is that uh, we can use these sounds to actually uh, age and also uh, sex the birds of prey that we are working with. Um, and for African fish eagles specifically, uh, the females are larger than the males. So that means basically they are able to uh, amplify a deeper voice than the males. And my colleagues who've uh, had longer experience with different fish eagles, uh, whenever they come across a pair they really know well, uh, they can be able to say that's the male, that's the female, uh, based uh, purely on just the amount of voice they are able to project and the depth of that call. So that's something you should definitely practice out there. Uh, and I encourage people to give themselves a challenge to try and learn uh, between the males and the females uh, in their region. Uh, but this is a species that can be found uh, quite, quite uh, well distributed across the continent. So we have a big, big population from the north heading towards the south. Uh, but uh, the main uh, concentrations are in the east and the southern parts of the continent. Um, but uh, something I thought I should mention is the significance of these eagles uh, to human culture and human uh, societies. So for example, in Namibia, uh, in Zambia, and in South Sudan, uh, their coat of arms have depictions of African crowned eagle uh, looking uh, birds. They may not be so particular or so exact, uh, but uh, they do have that uh, likely uh, resemblance to the African fish eagle. Uh, but these eagles are very, very interesting. This uh, individual here in this photo uh, depicts uh, a subadult or um, uh, an adult that's still uh, yet to molt. So this is not a chick in the nest. This is a fledged individual, but uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, it is still having some of those uh, streaks on the chest there, uh, those dark streaking on the white pattern. So when they are fully grown, which uh, takes about five years, they will have a clean uh, white chest and that makes them uh, adult in plumage. So uh, something I thought I should mention, which uh, might be a little bit out of uh, the region, uh, is the Madagascan fish eagle. So I'm only using one slide to mention this briefly, uh, because uh, it's still a fish eating eagle, even if it occurs uh, off the African coast. Uh, Madagascar is sometimes lumped together with the mainland Africa, uh, but sometimes it's taken to be semi-autonomous in the ocean there. Uh, so these are uh, African fish eagles are slightly different from the Madagascan fish eagles. As you can see in this image, these uh, Madagascan eagles are longer bodied and they have also darker patterns. So especially around that chest area, 
uh, where most of the African fish eagles get to be white, uh, the Madagascan eagles are dark. Um, and that's something nice to remember about the pattern of the chest, uh, because that's another way you can remember males and females by just looking at uh, how bright and how white their chests are. Uh, the females tend to have uh, more white than the females. Uh, and that's uh, just a fun fact for you to remember. So here we have an illustration of a video uh, of a fish eagle hunting. Uh, as you can see there, the talons going into the water first, uh, picking the fish and moving along. Uh, so this is something that is quite easily seen in most uh, of our wetlands where we have uh, tourism activities. Uh, the African fish eagles are very good at learning. Uh, so if humans do show them uh, that they can supply fish, uh, the fish eagles will come for those fish. Uh, however, from my own observations, if the fish eagles had eaten that day, they will often ignore and refuse to come for that uh, fish that is tossed by the humans. So the way that they do it is by whistling to the eagles uh, or calling to the eagles, and then uh, the eagles come to the food that they toss. And this is mainly done by uh, tour guides who operate boats. Uh, so a good example in my region here would be Lake Naivasha and uh, Lake Baringo. But fish are not the only items uh, that the African fish eagles eat. Uh, it's been recorded that they actually eat quite a wide variety of prey items from reptiles to frogs, uh, water birds. Um, personally, I have witnessed them eating a lot of uh, red knobbed coots uh, on Lake Naivasha, but they are becoming a bit rare these days. Uh, and then uh, around uh, Lake Bogoria, I have seen uh, fish eagles hunting lesser flamingos. So they do actually take wild birds uh, and they can also take small mammals up to sizes of monkeys. Uh, so fish is uh, preferred diet, but uh, they can add other things. Uh, something interesting I thought I should add here as well, in Uganda, uh, in the highlands of Uganda at least, uh, they have been observed to take carrion or uh, carcasses that have been left behind by lions. Uh, and at the same time also by leopards. So they do actually uh, love to eat carrion, so they don't have to hunt every time. Uh, once in a while, they will pick food that has been left. Uh, and they also do the same with fishermen. When fishermen come to uh, fish landing sites, like along the Lake, uh, Lake Victoria shores, they do come there and they enjoy the fish uh, and the carrion that is coming from the fishermen. So they are quite uh, diverse and adaptable. And I think that's a good thing uh, because it keeps them alive and it keeps them around. However, from what you can see here, these eagles hunt by sight, so they have to see the fish. So it means that uh, as uh, times are changing and lakes are becoming dirty and more turbidity uh, is being witnessed in most of our lakes, we might have a problem that uh, the fish eagles might not be able to see uh, where they are looking for the fish. Um, and another issue we have now in most of our lakes here in East Africa, at least, uh, is water hyacinth. So when the fish eagles are fishing and they need to see the fish that they need to pick, if there's a lot of uh, plants growing on the surfaces of these lakes, especially uh, water hyacinth to be particular, they don't actually do well in such scenarios. So we might be uh, having a decline in fish eagles uh, due to other factors, but uh, from my own point of view, I think uh, turbidity in the ocean and the lakes and also a lot of uh, plants, exotic plants growing in these lakes are contributing to that as well. Um, so I'll head on to the next item. Um, on this slide here, I want to talk a little bit about their breeding. Uh, so I hope everybody can see that uh, image on the top right corner. That's a young bird. And as you can see, they are very, very streaky and mottled and lots of uh, different colorations. They haven't acquired the beautiful color that is in the uh, adults, like you can see in the bottom central uh, section of this uh, screen. So those are adults and the upper one is a juvenile. Uh, so the juvenile uh, do actually have very, very different patterns, which we think uh, or personally I believe uh, is an adaptation uh, for them to be able to survive and not to be challenged by the adults. Um, and it has been observed that actually uh, fish eagle juveniles can concentrate and form groups, uh, but they often form those groups in places where they are not territorial adults. So they try to avoid the territories of the big guys, uh, but once in a while they will definitely be in those territories. And having these different colorations uh, could be a good thing for them because the adults don't view them as being competitors. So when you have a different coloration from the adults, uh, then the adults can tolerate you at least for some time. 
Um, the eggs are often uh, two most of the times uh, in, the, in the nests, but we've seen three or four, like you can see in this beautiful illustration uh, with those three chicks. Uh, that's beautiful footage from Lake Naivasha uh, by a friend uh, who shared this footage. Um, and the chicks uh, do not always survive. Sometimes the chicks that are older uh, will outcompete the younger ones. So that means that the younger ones would uh, uh, die. And that's a competition that is passive. So it's not that the bigger chicks are fighting the smaller chicks, it's more of a competitive uh, scenario. But uh, from my observations and uh, from the data that I've been able to dig up, uh, they tend to breed when the water is low. Uh, which is a good advantage for fish eating uh, raptors because when the water is low, then the fish are easier to get uh, and they can uh, obviously see closer to the bottoms of these lakes. And that is an advantage to nest and breed uh, when the water levels are much lower. Yeah. Here, um, uh, the fish eagle on the top right is fighting with a marabou stock. This is something that is really interesting uh, because when they do this, it's actually competition for food. Uh, so fish eagles, as I've mentioned, uh, don't have to always hunt. Um, and sometimes they can still prey from uh, birds such as storks uh, and herons. And that uh, process is called kleptopath parasitism, which is basically stealing uh, from another individual, from another species. So they do that a lot and have seen that to be more prevalent in juveniles uh, in places around Mount Kilimanjaro, like in the Amboseli swamps. Uh, I often see juvenile uh, African fish eagles uh, stealing food from herons and stocks. So that is common with the young ones, probably because they are not experienced enough. Uh, I think if they were experienced, they would probably go for the fish and hunt in a more um, uh, pre predominant way, which is like them owning that territory. But the juveniles who have not yet learned the craft and haven't learned how to do these things uh, in the right way will prefer to go and steal food because their chances of success in fishing uh, are a bit lower than the adults. Um, they can also be used for research, and uh, this is something that is being done uh, in several uh, lakes, like in the Rift Valley of Kenya, uh, where they are indicator species for the ecosystem health. So whenever you get these big uh, birds of prey surviving and thriving in a certain area, uh, two things come to mind. Um, number one being the availability of food, and number two being the availability of a home. So a home in this case would mean big trees for them to perch and relax uh, and uh, have a nice time. But also those big trees will form the basis for them to form their nests. So whenever we have a big population of African fish eagles, uh, it could uh, easily signal that uh, the habitat there is quite good and that the ecosystem is doing well. Whenever these go down, then uh, the reverse would be true. And uh, pollution is also another factor that can also lead to the reduction of fish eagles. So if there's less prey, if there is less trees for them to utilize, then the birds will be fewer. Either they die out or they can also migrate because we know they do occur uh, in uh, local migration. So they can move from one lake to another lake or from a lake to the ocean shores or from rivers as well. And they are very well adaptable. They have seen these guys even in towns. I've seen them in very close proximity to human habitation. As long as there's a small pond that has enough prey and enough trees for them, then they move in, including in big cities like Nairobi. So that is something that gives us hope that uh, the species can be able to survive if we support it well. Now I'll jump into the next uh, species in this uh, series, which is the osprey. And here the osprey that I've depicted uh, gives a very good illustration of uh, the distribution, as you can see in the top center section of this screen. So they occur in almost all parts of the world. I would think of only the Antarctica uh, being too inhospitable for the osprey. Otherwise, they can be anywhere. Uh, they can be close to humans. I've seen lots of uh, live webcams or web cameras that are really close to people's houses. And uh, this shows you that they can actually live uh, quite, quite well. Uh, in many diverse uh, populations. However, um, uh, there's a bit of uh, disagreement among the taxonomic world as to whether they are two species or one species of osprey. Uh, the ones to the extreme east, especially uh, the Australasian population, can sometimes be called the eastern ospreys and given their own uh, species uh, category. And then the ones to the west and the north can be given uh, the western osprey um, uh, division or uh, subdivision. So 
all the individuals we have in Africa would fall in the Western Osprey group. So that's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, and then the Eastern Osprey group, I'm not sure whether we do get any vagrants, but I would not expect them to move as far as we are here. Uh, but you can tell males from females from this illustration to the right here, uh, by looking at uh, the female's chest, uh, they often have a darker chest, big band on the chest that is dark or uh, dark brown, uh, and that misses in the male. So the males are pretty, clean on the chest and that's a good way to remember male from female but when they are flying you can also notice sometimes uh, that the females do have more markings on the underwings uh, more spotting and barring and also the couple areas which is just the joint uh, where the wings are meeting with the fingers uh, you get a lot of uh, dark markings around that couple area but something really interesting as you look at the head of the osprey here which is something different from the other individual we just looked at uh, the african fish eagle you realize they look like a pigeon. And I know lots of us in the room today uh, have done lots of budding, so you know pigeons and doves. When you look at the head of an osprey, it does look like it's a pigeon. It does look like it's a dove of some kind, but that is because they miss uh, a ridge which is found just above the eye. If I touch this section of my face here, so this ridge here, which is sometimes called the supraorbital ridge, uh, which means above the eye, which is uh, in many raptors used for defense. So <clears throat> Assuming a raptor was fighting with another or a raptor was flying through wooded habitats, that ridge would help to protect the eyes. Uh, but in ospreys, they miss that, which is particularly um, most likely because of their way of life, which does not need to protect the eyes. Uh, but that's something that is unique with ospreys, that they have that uh, pigeon-like uh, face. But uh, there are a few other birds of prey that also have that. Uh, however, when you compare the osprey to the African fish eagle, that's something that you can obviously notice. Uh, females are larger than males, and that's a characteristic that helps the females uh, to be able to care more for the young ones. Uh, and here we are looking at a hunting technique, which is a little bit different from the African fish eagle. So you can see the osprey goes right into the water kind of like uh, submerges the whole body. It's not always the case, but uh, most of the time that's what they do. Uh, and they can really catch large items. They can catch very heavy fish, uh, which sometimes drags them because the fish is still alive. So the fish is fighting in the water, as you can see in this scenario here. And the osprey is trying to uh, muscle up and get strong and try to move out of the water with it. Uh, but on my right here, you can see two illustrations of uh, the fish being held, uh, which is what we are looking at in the video. So when the fish is picked from the water, most of the time it's picked from the head uh, or the chest area, at least from the uh, individuals I have watched uh, hunting uh, from different videos. However, the uh, osprey immediately, it gets to uh, a certain good altitude. It changes the shape of the fish so that it's more parallel and it's more uh, aligned to be able to fight the wind. And you can see here in the top right corner, the fish is facing forward, which gives them that uh, better flight path and uh, helps the osprey to fly faster. So when the fish is just in a haphazard position, there would be a lot of resistance in the air. But if you position it uh, facing forward, then you get to be get better aerodynamics on that. So that's something interesting about the ospreys. Um, they do have very interesting feet, as you can see here. Uh, the feet have those very long claws or talons uh, that can really dig into the fish and really cause uh, the fish to be held very strongly, which is important because when you're hunting fish and the fish are very slippery, it means that if you cannot hold on to the fish, you will often be losing your catch. Uh, but to make it even more interesting, uh, the underside of the feet have extra spines or extra padding that adds more friction. And therefore, when they catch the fish, the fish has less chance to escape. And that is common even with the other uh, fish eating raptors. Uh, fish eagles do also have the same, but in this illustration here, you can see those really nice feet uh, of the osprey there. And the osprey have also an interesting adaptation where they can fold their, uh, their fingers and hold their toes backwards such that they can have two toes to the back of the fish and two toes to the front. So that allows them to hold the fish like you would hold them in your arm or in your hand. And that would allow the fish to be in a very, very nice grip. And therefore the osprey has a better chance uh, to move along with it. So they are very well adapted to their life and they are really uh, meant for this fishing lifestyle. So the osprey does really fit the bill here. Um, however, I want to look at something that was really in the news in Kenya. Um, we had an osprey that was caught uh, towards the Western part of the country uh, and it had a ring in the foot. 
So this osprey uh, was a four-year-old individual that unfortunately by that time was dead, uh, but it had migrated all the way from Finland. So this marked a journey of about 4,345 kilometers, which shows that these birds of prey can actually move very long distances. Um, and this brings me to another point that most of the ospreys we have in Africa, especially to the southern part of the continent, uh, are actually migratory or paleactic migrants. So these would come from parts as far north as Europe and Asia, uh, but they would uh, as well come from North Africa. So the North African belt there could also be regarded as being uh, part of the Paleactic migration. But uh, I think in 1963, there was a recorded uh, breeding uh, of an osprey in KwaZulu-Natal, that is in South Africa, which is quite far south. And that presents one of those odd scenarios whereby even if the species is migrating, there could always be some that are overwintering. And this has now been uh, observed in so many populations in East Africa, parts of Central Africa, parts of South Africa, where we have some ospreys that don't need to migrate. Uh, often these are individuals that feel they don't have a chance to breed. Uh, some could be young individuals that decide I don't need to breed this year so I could hang around a little longer. Uh, other individuals could be individuals that are old and probably they fear the journey and they don't want to make the attempt to go all the way. And we also have individuals that make the journey halfway. So they might move from South Africa way up to probably Sudan or uh, parts of uh, northern part of East Africa and then spend the year there and probably do the journey again next year. So they don't have to always move uh, to the Paleactic zone, they could do uh, shorter distances, which is something also that I find interesting. Um, their breeding uh, would typically not be something we see here in, uh, in our region. So I'm just going to highlight what we know from other regions. Uh, and this is a nest platform on the bottom left section here. So most parts of the North have actually started supplementing uh, breeding sites for birds of prey. And uh, I think, and I've heard this also from a few other people that we might actually do some uh, better good when we try to uh, support the birds of prey by giving them nesting platforms. So this could be boxes or a platform which is just a place where they can put their sticks. Uh, like in this case here where it's just a flat platform. Uh, for the smaller birds of prey, maybe a few of the owls, you could do a box and then they could use that and uh, we might be helping them to survive. So they do actually uh, enjoy using platforms like this. Uh, and we've had most of the time two to three eggs uh, that are uh, incubated for about 40 days. Uh, but uh, often we get what is called asynchronized uh, hatching. So that means the chicks would hatch at different times and would have bigger chicks and smaller chicks. And the smaller chicks would be in trouble from the bigger chicks. And sometimes we get cases of siblicide, which might be active or uh, passive, whereby the siblings might be fighting or they might be out competing each other uh, for food. But but they will fledge within a short time, uh, only about 50 days they are fledged, and that means they can be able to survive uh, if they make it through those first two months of their life. So polyandry has been recorded because this is a typically monogamous species, uh, but in the Red Sea there has been a few records of polyandry uh, where there would be more than one mating partners, uh, but that is not something we get often in, uh, here on the continent. Uh, but I thought I should just mention it there. So I'll jump uh, to owls, uh, which um, are also a bird of prey that uh, has been uh, doing this. And uh, here we have three species. So the first species is the vermiculated uh, fishing owl, uh, which is a widely spread or widely distributed owl from uh, West Africa uh, through places like uh, Cameroon, Central African Republic, uh, DR Congo, and possibly uh, might be entering Uganda on the uh, Western side, but there haven't been much work done on that side. So this is um, one of the owls that is really unique uh, because as you look at its face, uh, it doesn't have the ear tuft. So it's a very rounded face, uh, more circular uh, in shape. And uh, just like other owls that hunt at night, it has those big eyes to be able to see well at night, very, very broad wings. Uh, and uh, I would think of the ear tufts as not being so important for these owls because most of the time they actually hunt by sight. So they will see the ripples of water and then uh, jump in and try to catch the fish 
uh, mainly on riverbeds um, and uh, other wetlands like uh, dams and uh, shorelines of lakes. So that um, uh, the vermiculated fishing owl is the widest range on the west, but we have a smaller one uh, that has a smaller range that is called the Rufus fishing owl. Uh, and this is really down towards Liberia. It's a very small population, uh, maybe a little bit of Guinea there um, and Sierra Leone. So it's not something that uh, most people have studied. It's quite a less known uh, species, but uh, among Amongst all these uh, three fishing owls that I'm talking about, the one that we probably know the most is the Pell's fishing owl, uh, which is the one that is calling now. And in that tip, you can hear the sounds of frogs, so that means it's probably somewhere near some wetland or a lake or a, or a river. Um, so the Pell's fishing owl is an owl that personally uh, have been uh, fortunate to see and study a little bit. Uh, they are not very common in my country, Kenya, where I live, but we have a few populations in the uh, eastern side where we do get to see them in places like Meru. But this population goes all the way south towards South Africa, uh, and you can get them in different disjunct populations. So they are not always dense. They are mainly in scattered populations, uh, and they like wooded rivers or wooded uh, wetlands, which could also be dams and could be lake shores, uh, but they love them to be wooded because typically during the day they hide. Uh, and I've tried looking for these owls in places where you would expect to see them during the day. And most of the time you cannot succeed during the day. However, I've been lucky on some uh, night searches. If you go to the right places, you would be uh, in a good position and especially when they are breeding. And one thing that I found really interesting when I was following one pair in Southern Tanzania is that these birds can actually live in villages. So I went to the Uzungwa mountains and I remember one night we were following uh, a stakeout where somebody had told us they saw one earlier. And we went to a local village and they flew into the village, sat above a house and uh, sat in a pantry that was just above a house. Uh, and they stayed there for almost half an hour without even worrying about the activities that were happening below them. So they would be secretive and they prefer that life where they hide a lot. Uh, but I've often seen that uh, given the right conditions and as long as they are not being harassed, they can move closer to humans uh, like that place uh, near the Udzungwa mountains where they often move into a village. Um, this is the distribution. So you can see there's a lot of them uh, scattered across the continent, as you can see in this map here. So parts of Ethiopia moving all the way to parts of Senegal in the west, uh, central parts of DR Congo, through Zambia, all the way to South Africa. Uh, you can see there are even populations as far south as Durban. Uh, so I think this is an owl that uh, definitely has a wide range and it's not considered endangered uh, when it comes to classification, uh, but it's an owl definitely needing a lot of protection because if it loses habitat, just like the other two fishing owls, then uh, we would be in a scenario where we would have extinction uh, because these are owls that really depend on uh, riverbeds and depend on swamps uh, and lakes, which are some of the most endangered uh, habitats in Africa. So typically they catch the fish uh, by watching the ripples in the water and then they'll swoop down. Uh, so they will typically be standing uh, or patching on a stick or a branch. Uh, and when there are ripples in the water, they'll swoop in and uh, grab the fish with their feet. Uh, strong talons, just like any other bird of prey, they catch with the feet, they don't catch with the bills. Uh, and they can catch fish that are quite heavy. So we've had records of uh, 2000 grams, which is about two kilograms uh, of fish. And then they also catch frogs and crabs and mussels. So they do uh, typically have a wide range of diet. They don't have to always go for the fish. Uh, they typically will hunt what is available uh, in their area. But they don't like to immerse in water like we saw with the osprey. Uh, they don't like to dive into the water itself. Uh, but there have been scenarios where they've been recorded dragging food uh, along some part of swamps or uh, edges of water. And it's thought that they can do a bit of wedding like a heron would do or or like a stock would do. So they wade a little bit um, along the edges of the water. So they don't always have to typically pick fish and leave. They can pick the fish and drag about, and they can also wade looking for food. So this is something that uh, we are still learning more, uh, but it's something that I would encourage everybody who has a population of these owls near them to just observe how much of their time they spend wading, uh, looking for food and uh, versus sitting and uh, pouncing on prey, because that's definitely uh, something interesting. 
So uh, these owls will typically lay one to two eggs, uh, but most of the times it's only one chick that survives. Uh, from all the individuals I have personally seen, they are not many, but um, I have only seen one chick. Uh, incubation periods are about a month. Um, and of course, uh, they will stay with the parents when they are chicks for about two months, then they will fledge. Uh, they stick around that territory. The territories are mainly monogamous. Uh, I haven't had a record of polygamy uh, in this group. Uh, they will stick around the polyga and the monogamous, sorry, uh, pairs of the adults until when they are ready to leave. And then when they are mature, they will move on. But uh, something interesting about their breeding is that they breed in dead cavities of trees. Uh, so there'll be like a broken tree or a tree that was used by other animals. And then the, when that cavity is really nice and soft, they lay their eggs in there. Uh, and the females are the ones who do the brooding and they get fed by the males, uh, at least in the individuals that have been studied. Uh, and that would mean that we need also some dead trees in the habitat, which means uh, that even collecting firewood might be something we might reconsider for big old trees. Uh, that might have holes and that might be able to provide a habitat uh, for these owls. So as you can see in this illustration here, that's a typical nest situation. Uh, this was from Warwick uh, in 1987, uh, where he got that image uh, with that nice hollow uh, tree. And there has also been a few records where they can inherit uh, nests. And I've seen uh, examples of inherited nests being those of hammercops. So they can pick old hammercop nests and just decide not to do any refurbishing. They will just move in there uh, and raise their chicks in that uh, hammercop nest. So that's the end of my 25 minutes. Uh, so I hope uh, we can uh, allow room for some questions. I'm sure my friend Kaylin has been picking the questions on the chat room. Uh, so that was just uh, to provoke the thought line. Uh, I'm sure we shall be able to chat more uh, with, with your questions and with the chat room. Thank you so much. Fantastic, Washington. Thank you so much for that, uh, that super exciting talk there. That is, a, without doubt, one of the most interesting groups of raptors um, on the continent. We have been getting quite a few uh, questions, which are really great. We're, but uh, we're actually going to, we've, we've taken note of all those questions. We're going to deal with them at the end um, of the entire session. Um, so, so Washington, hold on there. We'll definitely ask you those questions. Um, what you're going to see in front of you right now is a QR code for Share Screen Africa. Uh, you guys are welcome to whip out your phones, scan that QR code. It's going to take you to sharescreenafrica.org. Um, remember, I mentioned to you guys in the beginning, uh, for everyone that has not managed to see those talks that, we, that we've that we done in the past couple of weeks, um, that's where you're going to find those talks. Uh, scan that. You can contact Share Screen Africa directly. Um, ask them, uh, you, you can contact them and ask them if uh, if there's talks that you, that you, um, particularly want to see, um, they'll be able to share that with you. So um, yeah, that, that QR code is uh, for you guys to, um, to scan and use. Um, the next up, we are going to be taking a trip to Lake Naivasha with uh, Pranav to see what he does with uh with um african fish eagles um i remember um, I, washington spoke about them briefly in the beginning of his talk um this is going to be a little bit more uh on on hands-on work um with pranav uh marit is that is that video ready to go Lake Naivasha is a freshwater lake in Kenya's Rift Valley and is home to what might very well be Eastern Africa's densest population of African fish eagles. In 1995, Lake Naivasha was designated as a Ramsar site for its diverse wetland areas and importance as a habitat for threatened water birds among other things. It has an extremely high bird species richness in the riparian ecotone surrounding the lake and is also recognized as an important bird area. My name is Pranav Pashavarya and as part of my undergraduate thesis I studied the African fish eagles at Lake Naivasha and this is where my uh, fascination in raptors stemmed from. Uh, through this study I, I learned a great deal more about uh, these iconic African raptors and just how cool they are. 
The African fish eagle's scientific name is Haliatus vocifer. Haliatus comes from the Greek hali, which means sea, and atos, which means eagle. Vocifer comes from the Latin word vociferari, which combines vox, meaning voice, and ferre, which means to carry. So in short, Haliatus vocifer translates to a loud sea eagle owing to their loud distinctive calls. African fish eagles are fish-eating raptors and as their name suggests they primarily feed on fish but will occasionally take other prey like coots and other waterfowl. Being mainly piscivores, i.e. fish eaters, they are designed slightly different from most mammal hunting raptors in that the soles of their feet are covered in small rough spines called spicules. Now these birds would make for horrible neighbours. They are some of the most territorial raptors there are and they defend their territories fiercely. They guard their territories in one of two ways, through vocalisation or by chasing and attacking intruders. They call to warn other fish eagles that they are the owners of this territory and as a keep out signal. Currently, a pair of African fish eagles in Lake Nevasha will hold a territory along the shoreline of about 300 metres, give or take. Their territories are very well defined and you can have two adjacent pairs sitting calmly on the edges of their territories, but as soon as one fish eagle moves closer into its neighbour's territory, they will instantly start calling and chase the intruder away. The reason for their extremely territorial behaviour is not fully understood and it may be due to a number of factors, the most likely being that they are defending their nesting space. The purpose of defending a territory is to allow for the continued use of a resource. Now in the case of the African fish eagle, the main resources they gain from their territories are food and nesting space, and being monogamous rules out the possibility that they would establish a territory to find a mate. Their main prey are fish, and since fish can move into different fish eagle territories, they cannot be defending them, hence food can be ruled out as an explanation for territoriality. Although, Leslie Brown, who first studied the fish eagles in Lake Nevasha in the 1960s, found a pair that held a territory with a nest in it and did not breed for 18 months, while a pair on the adjacent territory bred three times in the same 18-month period. So in 2021, Shiv Kapila from the Kenya Birds of Prey Trust and myself uh, conducted some surveys of the lake. Uh, we conducted two fish eagle surveys and a single habitat survey following methods used by Leslie Brown uh, from when he began the study in the early 1950s. The fish eagle population at Lake Nevasha closely mirrors the water levels of the lake and in recent years has increased to an all-time high. In the last survey in 2021, there were a total of 331 individuals recorded. This is the highest recorded population at Lake Nevasha. The distribution of fish eagles around the lake is dependent on the habitat quality. Therefore, as part of the study, the habitat quality around the lake was assessed and categorized. Fish eagles prefer steep rocky shores and large trees close to the shoreline from which they can hunt. Large trees close to the shoreline also make for good nesting sites and mean that they don't have to travel very far to find food. Fish eagles also need to see the fish they are hunting. There are lots of estimates regarding the visual acuity of raptors as a group, ranging from 4 to 20 times better than a human's vision. But what we do know is that fish eagles certainly have better vision than us. To put this into perspective, even if their vision was four to five times better than ours, it would mean that they can see an ant on the ground from a 10-story building. Although, even with exceptional vision, if the waters are murky, the fish eagles may not be able to see the fish and therefore, as part of the study, water clarity measurements were taken at different points around the lake. Habitat quality was scored and the results showed that fish eagles concentrated around the best quality habitats with steep shores and large trees. Another factor influencing the distribution of fish eagles is how close the tree line is to the lake shore, the tree line to shoreline length. The shorter the tree line to shoreline length, the better it is for fish eagles. With large scale development around the lake, the loss of tree cover means that fish eagles have fewer suitable nesting trees 
In areas where flower farms exist, the tree line to shoreline length is more than a kilometer. The study showed a negative trend with the number of fish eagles seen as the tree line to shoreline length increased. Lake Nevasha has been subject to fluctuating water levels. As the water levels increase, the amount of available shoreline also increases, which essentially means that there is more space for fish eagles. With fish eagles, territory is everything. As the lake levels drop, the length of available shoreline decreases, which means fish eagles get packed closer together, and due to their territorial nature, some pairs or individuals will inevitably be forced out or worse. And so, in this way, their population around the lake rises and falls with the water levels. This study was part of an existing long-term study on African fish eagles started by Leslie Brown in the early 1950s and forms the largest data set on any wild African fish eagle population. These birds are incredibly fascinating and there is still lots of work to be done to fully understand their population dynamics and behaviour. Being able to study these birds and contribute to this large data set was truly an amazing experience. I only hope that we can continue to study the fish eagles and all our wonderful raptors for that matter, as these studies are vital to conserving this magnificent group of birds. Fantastic. Uh, so that was uh, Pranav on his work on, on fish eagles in Lake Navasha. Great news. I believe Pranav is actually in the audience today. So if you have any <clears throat> questions relating to that work in Lake Navasha, I'm sure he will be more than happy um, to chat to you guys about that um, once we're done uh, with the next video. Um, perfect. And this is Simon Thompson. <laughs> This is the first year fish eagle. Some people would look at this and think it's the second year fish eagle because of the amount of white on the chest. They're very variable in their first year. Has a white tail with a black bar. The tail in about three or four years will start to get completely white. Gorgeous birds, very common on Lake Navasha. And this guy came in because of competition on the lake. There's literally some 300 birds there. You can see that it has very, very sharply curved talons, and that's obviously meant to catch fish. The bottom of the toes have spicules, or little sharp protrudents that catch on slippery fish. Fish eagles take about three years before they start looking like adults. In about four years, they are inseparable from adults. They have a nice sort of a ruddy brick red color on the back of their wings and a pure white head. Occasionally, we'll have up to three chicks in the nest. Certainly a Lake Navasha that's been recorded. It's not that unusual for them to have two. Most of the time, they have one. Both the male and the female will do the incubation and the brooding. The male will take over the first part of the chick rearing period in the sense he goes off and catches all the food and brings it back to the female. She, the female being much bigger, sits by the nest most of the time. They tend to still hunt. They must have very good polarized vision because when they sit, they can see things at an angle that we can't possibly, we just see glare. We see a mirrored image, we can't possibly see through it and it's always Amazing to see these guys fly out with a determined flight to hit a fish that's, say, six inches under the water. That's utterly impossible for us to see because it's just too much glare. So they must have some kind of polarized vision. They hit it with their feet first, head second. Sometimes they will uh, go straight in up to their heads, but they're not really like ospreys. Ospreys are the classic ones that will dive up to a meter underwater, and ospreys will hit the water with their faces incredibly hard. These tend to push their feet out slightly before their face hits the water. It's usually quite a forceful impact. Sometimes they just snap off the surface of the water. Very much part of the tourist routine here on Lake Naivasha is to throw fish out for them. It isn't just an amusement, actually. It's caused a, a big increase in the population 
Those particular pairs that get fed by tourists have more chicks than the others, so they actually are quite a benefit from the tourism industry. Hello. It's naughty boy. He's a little nervous. Um, he had a hole in his wing uh, because of a fight with other fish eagles. That's quite typical of what we get. Uh, pretty much 90% of all the fish eagle injuries as we get in for rehab are because they have fights between themselves. This we actually let go a couple of months ago and found that it really wasn't able to fly very well. So we've taken it back into captivity and now it's being trained up again, flying basically like a falconry bird. It's now strong enough for it to circle around. If we lose it, we lose it. I'm not really of the opinion that we need to go and do another hard release. If in time it wishes to go, it will. I kind of like those long, prolonged hacks. It's called soft releases. The fish eagle is called vocifer for a reason. It's very noisy, very vociferous. And sometimes they're called the voice of Africa, where they are heard, you know, across the lake and they throw their voices with a huge effort by throwing their heads over the back shouting out loud they also do that when they're flying in midair so they go along and they suddenly throw their heads over their shoulders and yell kind of lose control a bit they're incredibly noisy it's an incredible sound everybody's familiar with it it's often misplayed on a lot of african movies out in the middle of a dry savannah area where they can't possibly be but it is a very evocative african sound So, we've just come across one of our glider poles fishing our turkeys and John's, we just flushed the female out of the nesting cavity and there's two eggs in the, in the nest. This is awesome. Okay, so we've just made it up there. The first pole fishing our nest of the season with eggs on it. Look at that beautiful little cavity. Um, this is my first nest that I've ever seen, but it's amazing. The Pulitzer's fishing owl is one of Africa's largest owls. In fact, it's larger than the Vero's eagle owl. In Eastern Africa, its population must have declined by over 90% within the last 30 years or so. Should, in theory, be uplisted to endangered. It's very familiar to documentary filmmakers in places like the Okavango and in Zambia, where they can become quite habituated to humans and come down and take fish in very much the same way as the African fish eagle will do. And like the African fish eagle and the osprey, it has bare tarsus, very, very sharp curved talons and spiky spicules on the bottom of its feet to catch slippery fish. It's actually quite a variable species, some of which are very pale and some of which are quite rufous. It doesn't have a silent flight, it doesn't need to have a silent flight because fish don't hear. So it's actually quite noisy when it takes off and lands. It can plunge into the water just like an osprey, goes in head and feet first, disappears underwater and comes out shaking its head. It's odd that it can find fish sometimes on very dark nights. Fish are not easy to catch anyway but extremely difficult to catch at night time and one must question whether or not it uses its ears to locate the fish as they come to the surface of the water this is the first pulse fishing or chick that i've ever held unbelievably cute So um, that, that little bit of footage that you saw at the end with the Pals Fishing Hall was uh, filmed by Dr. Kareth Tate from the Endangered Wildlife Trust. Uh, he, for those of you that had uh, joined our, our initial launch of the series, uh, Gareth was our headline speaker 
um, that day. So fantastic videos um, shows you just how incredible these these fishing raptors uh, or these fish eating raptors rather of uh, of Africa can be. Uh, amazing a animals to see, uh, even cooler to see to have in hand. Uh, so thank you everybody that uh, provided those uh, that footage and 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 background. Um, so that brings us to the part of the night that I am. Um, sometimes actually enjoy the most and that's that's interacting with all of you and getting some of your awesome questions and actually as the session's been going we've been recording some of these questions so um if uh, if you would like to ask a question or you'd like to tell us about an experience of your own please uh, either raise your hand so at the bottom of your bar there uh, under reactions just click reactions and raise your hand uh, and we'll get to you. Otherwise, if you'd rather us read your question out, just go to the chat box, type in your question to us and we'll read it out. Um, so, Kaylin, I'm going to venture forth. I'm not sure which expert you're going to refer me to. Um, to perhaps perhaps you can ask, uh, answer the question yourself. We've received an apology from uh, one of our regular attendees on Share Screen Africa and Unlocking Nature, Sandra Hardy, who desperately wanted to be a but she unfortunately had to attend a family event. Um, she's reared a fish eagle <clears throat> and recently, and she's kept basically kept in touch with the fish eagle every morning. It came to her house with, with its mate and they, they, had, they had some time together every morning. Let's put it that way. And recently the fish eagle disappeared. And this has been like a 20 year relationship and, and a local bird expert um uh, said that maybe the, the fish eagle passed away so she wanted to know would that be a normal lifespan for for a fish eagle around about 20 years or what would be the um, lifespan for a fish eagle yeah so fish eagles i mean like you like many of your large raptors um are quite long-lived species fish eagles are quite long-lived 20 years easily um uh, those 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 birds can reach that age uh, and more actually but um they tend to also they tend to also uh, sometimes uh, succumb to to territorial disputes um you'll have uh, fights between individuals um and unfortunately there are a lot of uh, man-made threats that can sometimes cause these birds to uh, to die um so 20 years, definitely easy for that bird to, to reach that age, but it, it could be um, uh, something else that actually caused uh, caused that death um, or that disappearance. Maybe that bird even moved uh, moved territory or moved out of that territory, pushed out by another bird um, in the area. Thanks, Kaylin. She'll be watching the video, so she'll pick up on, on the answer. Thank you very much. One of the first questions that we got uh, in the night, and that is, do fish-eating e raptors have uh, any digestive adaptations to digest their fish meals? So I think, uh, Washington, if you can, if you can take that, um, that'll be great. Um, thank you for that question. Um, as with any other bird of prey, I find that uh, fishing it, fish eating owls are not, uh, or fish eating raptors, including the eagles, are not exclusive feeders. So that they can feed on uh, pretty much a variety of items. So most of the raptors have very strong juices because they, they have a tendency to swallow food that contains bones. Uh, but even when they cannot actually digest those bone items, most of the birds of prey have adapted a mechanism of uh, vomiting the bad items or the tough items. So this could include feathers, uh, could include bones, uh, could include any tough parts that they are not likely to be able to digest, which in some cases is even uh, including the skin of certain animals. So this has been observed in many species whereby they do that uh, vomiting or uh, removal of pellets. Uh, there are many technical terms for it, but basically uh, that's one of the ways that these birds of prey are able to deal with tough materials. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Washington, for that. Um, the next question um, is actually linked to our previous talks, but maybe Washington, you, you'd have a, a, a thought a thought on this, and that is uh, from Jared Loden. Uh, do all raptors have those spiky structures? I think he's talking about the, the barbs at the back of the tongue. Uh, do all raptors have those spicy spiky structures uh, at the uh, uh, in their tongue or on their tongue for grasping prey during flight? 
I think he means during during feeding, actually. Um, yeah, that's a good uh, point. Yes, that is something that has been observed in birds of prey. Um, however, I find that it is more useful to birds of prey that dismember, that uh, slice parts of the prey items. Uh, but for birds of prey that kind of prefer to swallow uh, their food whole, like in owls, um, I would find that not being so useful because most of the time the owls will kill the item. For example, it's a mouse or fish. Uh, they will kill the item and then swallow it by shaking the head backwards and trying to use gravity uh, and forces to push it. Uh, so that would probably be my thought, uh, but it's something that is definitely interesting from the other talks. I remember that. Um, and that would probably be my thinking that you need to have uh, a way of dismembering the food for you to have a use for that. And that could explain why probably mammals have teeth uh, and why crocodiles have a different uh, feeding mechanism because of their fused tongues uh, where they need to rip parts and probably push them backwards with uh, strong head shakes and uh, gravity as well, yeah. Okay, thanks Washington. The next question uh, is also for you actually. Um, and this is from Fiona Fern Clark um, who wants to know why is the lack of ear tufts significant? I think that's specifically for your, uh, your different fish eating owls why is those uh, why is the lack of those ear tufts significant um, that's a good question. So it doesn't mean that they have a physical function as at, uh, as per my knowledge, because there are other e uh, owls that do not also have uh, tufts. So for example, uh, the great uh, owls from the north, they don't always have uh, tufts, uh, but some owls also add something called a fissure disc, uh, which is believed to direct the sound. So when uh, owls are hunting by hearing, uh, they would be able to use that uh, for directing sound. Uh, but as we've learned this evening, uh, uh, most of the fish eating owls do not need to hunt something that is listening. So listening to them is not a priority in reverse as well. So the items they hunt are probably not hearing them because these are fish. So if they were to hunt a mouse or other mammals, they would probably be more careful and they would depend on actually even assessing their own sound to be able to understand that. So probably that explains the lack of the discs. Uh, but for ear tufts, it's also something that uh, is used for camouflage, like uh, turning the shape of an animal. So like I've seen this in smaller owls whereby they make their tufts uh, uh, create an image or uh, an illusion that they are actually part of a stick or part of a tree. Uh, and they can also look a little bit mammal-like by having those ear tufts look like ears on a mammal's face. Uh, so these are all sets of uh, adaptations that to me, the fish eating owls don't need because of the lifestyle they live. So these are owls that we live in very bushed uh, wooded habitats and just remain there still for the whole day. Unless you of course flush them walking underneath, they will stay there until the night comes. And when then the night comes, they are not aiming mainly for mammals. They will be mainly aiming to catch fish uh, who don't listen as much as the mammals, yeah. All right. Okay, great. Well, that, that was uh, well answered. Thank you, Washington. Uh, I see Brian. Brian, great to see you again. Um, you got your hand up. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you so much, Karen. And uh, Washington, thank you also for the presentation. I'm only provoked by the saying that some birds of prey dismember to feed on their prey. And when you mentioned that some, I don't know whether it's some all or all, all of them would swallow fish as a whole. I'm just looking at the size of a fish or the prey that will be caught and then trying to swallow it all. I mean, so then does it mean that they're just specific to the size of prey or rather fish that they catch at their diet? Um, thank you for that, Brian. That's a really nice uh, <laughs> reason uh, to actually provoke uh, size. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, these owls, uh, like the Pels fishing owl, which is the largest fishing owl we have, uh, 
uh, has been known to catch fish up to two kilograms. So a two kilogram fish would probably not be easy to swallow all. Uh, so birds of prey have different ways of dealing with this. Um, some will dismember their prey using their feet, uh, whereas others will carry their food to a certain spot and then start ripping parts of that food with their bill. So those are the two ways I've observed animals dealing with large items. Uh, but if the item is small enough, then it goes straight in. And I've watched uh, birds swallow without any problems at all. Yeah, you will be surprised how much these animals can swallow uh, because they are not actually pushing the food uh, to be able to, to go and choke them. They are simply pushing the food uh, for them to be able to clear and be quick because remember they have competition. So if you spend too much time with food, uh, then somebody else might even steal the food from you. Uh, like we learned with the African fish eagles where there's a lot of competition. So you should try as much as possible to be efficient with your feeding and do it as quickly as possible. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Thanks, Brian, for that question. Uh, the next, next question we have is from Noah. Um, are birds of prey caring mothers during hatching? Uh, that's a really good question. Yeah, so birds of prey are caring. Uh, they are really good parents, in my opinion. Um, and here is where it becomes really interesting because most of these birds of prey have uh, reversed sexual dimorphism, which means uh, the boys or the males are smaller and the females are larger. So that helps them with two things, in my opinion. Number one is the larger female is the one who is going to stay closer to the nest. So if there's an intruder, she's bigger and she can fight the intruder. Uh, when she needs to sit on the edge, Eggs. She has a bigger body, so that means she's able to sit on the whole nest and warm those eggs really nicely. Well, the smaller male will do two things. Number one, he will be in charge of moving around and uh, collecting sticks and bringing extra materials for the nest. But the second most important thing is he does most of the hunting. Um, and mostly this happens at the early stages of the egg uh, brooding process, uh, where the male will really be doing a lot of runs to go and fetch food and bring it back to the nest. And the female will be in charge of feeding. Uh, but even when the chicks are hatched, the female does most of the selective feeding. So when the males brings in the food, the female will break it into smaller parts uh, and selectively feed the chicks. So yes, that is a good uh, thing and they are very, very good parents. Uh, in my opinion, I haven't seen um, a birds of prey fighting young ones unless those young ones don't belong in their territory uh, or they are trying to force them to fledge out of the territory. So that time when they are forcing them to fledge, they are already big chicks and one of the easiest ways I've seen them do is depriving them of food. So they will stop giving them food at the right frequency so that the chick feels hungry and moves along or they will start moving the food away from the nest. So at the early stages, they often bring the food closer to the nest. When the chick is ready to leave and when the parents feel they need to kick this chick out of their territory, they'll bring food back, but they'll keep it a little bit of a distance away from the nest and then call to the chick. So that is encouraging the chick to move along and get away from the nest. And these are some of the strategies they use, but at that time still as a loving parent, trying to encourage their chicks to become independent. Thanks, Washington. Um, the next question is from Emlyn. Uh, Emlyn wants to know, to what extent is holding a raptor a dangerous activity as a, uh, as a risk of that handler's face being picked, uh, picked at? Good question, Emlyn. <laughs> wow, we're having some really good questions here. Um, yeah, Emily, that's a really relevant question. I'm sure it's because of the videos we've just watched um, and some of the photos I showed there. So holding a bird of prey is about uh, care and respect. So you have to really respect these birds. Uh, but birds of prey, now that you ask the question in the whole context, uh, can be divided into two. There are birds of prey who use their feet and there are birds of prey who predominantly use their bills. Uh, examples are vultures. So when you're handling a vulture, the most important part to watch for is the bill. And lots of the time, if you are to hold a vulture, I would encourage you to hold closer to the head and closer to the neck so that you have confidence that you are in charge and in control of that part. Because a vulture can easily rip off your face and tear your skin. Uh, but when you're handling bigger uh, sections of the collection of raptors, like most of the other raptors who mainly depend on their feet, the place to watch for is their feet. Um, but when you see us holding uh, birds of prey in the arm, most of these birds of prey have kind of been used to being uh, 
uh, held in the hand uh, and they will understand the temperament of the human holding them and they will also recognize a new face. So I have personally visited uh, collections where uh, birds are being rehabilitated, uh, for example, by Simon who works with lots of different species. And if they don't know me, they will be a bit wary at first, but you'll notice a difference when Simon gets into the same building, uh, they will not fear him as much. Then we stay with them maybe for about half an hour, one hour, and they'll start becoming more cozy and understanding. And they now realize that I do not mean danger to them because the first instinct when they see you, they think of you as being a foreign being and they don't know if you are safe or you've come with uh, bad intentions. So they'll be wary as usual. And then once they understand that you don't mean any harm, they will allow you to handle them and feed them. And I learned this the hard way when I was in high school, when I handled an ogre buzzard that I was trying to rehabilitate, uh, which was injured in my school compound. So at first, I really got the talons and I really got lots of scratches. Uh, but over time, uh, I learned how to approach it kindly and be very patient with it. Uh, and eventually we were friends and uh, no more injuries were seen after that. Yeah. Thanks, Washington. Yes, I think to, to add to, to, to Washington's answer there, um, especially from my experience ringing raptors, the majority of the time, they, their talons are their primary uh, weapon in their arsenal. They, they, they very rarely, unlike your smaller birds, like your weavers and things like that, that use their beak readily um, to defend themselves. Raptors, their go-to are their talons. And so, so making sure, if it, as, as Washington said, a captive bird is a lot less likely to attack with the talons because they know that they're just being handled under normal circumstances. Whereas wild birds, you'll often see when, uh, when, when handlers are, are handling wild raptors, those talons are under control all the time uh, because they are extremely, extremely strong and they can do some ex very bad damage. Uh, there's been, in fact, I know uh, uh, Simon had a, had a run in with, uh, with a, a crown eagle once, uh, which turned very bad. I'll, I'll, I'll wait for him to be online to tell you the story about that. But um, yeah, the, ta the talons are what you're looking, uh, looking to, to handle um, first and foremost. Um, the next question I see from Rio, uh, he wanted he wanted you Washington to repeat the full dimorphism na uh, dimorphism name. Um, I think you mentioned dimorphism in in your talk somewhere. He wanted to, you to just to repeat that name again, if you can. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, so <laughs> dimorphism, it means differences or having something that uh, is different between two individuals or two uh, sexes. So with most birds, uh, for me being uh, mainly uh, working with the different families of birds, I've realized that, for example, in weaver birds or in sun birds, most of the species you find that the males are more colorful than the females or uh, most of the species, at least within the African continent, even the ostriches, most of them, the dark, the males will be more colorful. So that is called sexual dimorphism or differences between males and females. So when you reverse that and you have that the female has something that the male is lacking, we call that reversed sexual dimorphism. So I think that's where the name came up. So where I was saying that the females in most of these birds will be even larger in size than the males, whereas in most of the other birds, you find that the male is the larger one than the female. So in birds of prey, quite a number of species, you get that uh, is reversed. Yes, reversed sexual dimorphism. Perfect. Thanks for clearing that up, uh, Washington. We've got another question from Angie. Uh, Angie wants to know, she says, seeing that some fish have barbs on their back and the abundance of thorn trees, I'm assuming in their habitats, have you ever seen fish eating raptors with severe bumblefoot? And if so, uh, have you noticed any differences in their hunting? That's a really interesting question. I think uh, that will be perfect for Simon if he was around because I know he has handled uh, birds of prey that have those injuries on the uh, bottom sides of their feet. Um, and that could be caused by different things. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I really advocate is for people not to handle birds of prey or to keep birds of prey uh, if they are not real experts or they have not done that uh, with a trained expert before. Because one of the things that causes the bumblefoot is actually people putting 
uh, something that is not good uh, at the bottom or at the uh, footholds of the birds of prey. So let's say, for example, where the houses or the housings of these birds are, if you don't preserve uh, the surfaces or the patching pads where the birds of prey will come and patch, they often patch on very tough surfaces and that causes injuries to their feet. So I always encourage if you don't know how to deal with birds of prey, it's okay to just accept and hand over to somebody who can do a good job. And because at the end of the day, we are all there for the well being of the species. Uh, and I would expect, even in the wild, if an injury happens to the bottom of the feet with these birds of prey that are feeding on fish, then it will be a problem. I have personally not had a scenario where I realized a bird was not able to hunt, and I could attribute that to being uh, that they had an injury on the bottom of their feet. But uh, I have personally seen uh, birds of prey that have injuries on their feet, and I would not give them a big chance in the field or in the wild. So yes, I think that is a possible uh, scenario. If they have injuries on the bottoms of their feet, they would have a problem hunting. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think uh, also just to add to that, I have personally never seen uh, a raptor in the wild um, with bumblefoot. I think it's a it's a, a condition and an injury that's that's mainly experienced in captive birds, um, and particularly birds as as Washington uh, mentioned, kept um, illegally a lot of the time in very bad conditions and the wrong conditions. Um, so yeah, very, I don't I don't think it's a very common. Uh, scenario in wild in, in wild raptors that aren't kept in captivity but yeah thank you for that question um angie uh brian i see your hand up is that an old hand or is that a new one a new one <laughs> new one fantastic go for it cool no um i don't know if this again is still relevant to washington but yeah i'm i'm quite attached to raptors so then i'm Having this question about vultures, or other things, this could just be applying to all raptors, now that these are huge birds. Then now when they have their young ones in the nest, after how long, and I really want to know the relationship at the nests, when we have a young one, and then the, say, the female and the male, how do they get to share the nest in the wild in this case? And if again, beyond that, then how long would they have the young one in the nest after, I mean, after hatching, of course. Was that clear? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think I mentioned this in some of my talks. So basically what happens is the bigger the bird, uh, the more likely it will stay longer in the nest and uh, the more likely it will stay before it becomes sexually mature or a full adult. Um, but uh, in most of these birds that we are dealing with, the range is about 40 days to two months. That's about the range when they will stay in the nest, uh, during which they are actually being fed actively by the parents. Uh, once they get out of the nest, then they can stay with the parents for sometimes one one year uh, or a little bit longer depending on the species because different birds of prey respond differently uh, but they will still remain as a child or as a chick if I use that word uh, because uh, they have stages so they start from a juvenile to a fledgling to being an immature individual to a sub-adult until they become a full adult uh, and as we learned for example with the fish eagles by around four years they are still a sub-adult but the plumage color is already close enough to that of an adult. But from my estimate, at least five years is a good bet for such a species for them to be fully independent and to be uh, fully adult. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned at the beginning is that it ranges across species, uh, the bigger species taking longer while the smaller species take a shorter time. And I have also observed, and I think this is true for most birds, uh, that uh, those species that need to move, those that need to migrate, often develop quicker and species that do not need to migrate. So like our resident species, they know that that territory is not being taken away from them and seasons are not going to change. So they will likely uh, take a longer time. And a good case study is birds of prey that occur between Southern Africa and East Africa. We find that the East African birds take longer and take their time because they know the weather and the climate here is quite constant. Whereas birds in Southern Africa, where they have the four seasons, they know that they only have that short breeding time and then they need to move along. A perfect example is crowned eagles breeding cycles. 
uh, that I have been able to compare with a few friends who work in Southern Africa. Our eagles in East Africa take longer between chicks. Even the parents themselves take a little bit longer before they get the next chick compared to those in Southern Africa. So all these are diverse scenarios, but I'll leave it at there <laughs> for now, yeah. Perfect, thanks Washington. Uh, we've got a, a, a question from Peter. Yeah, Peter. Do we have extreme forms of sibling rivalry in these birds' nests uh, that may lead to siblicide? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another interesting one, yes. So siblicide could be in two ways. Um, and I briefly mentioned this when I was starting. So a lot of people in the birding world use uh, the term infanticide, but infanticide could mean the infant has been killed by the parent or by another adult individual. But when it's the young ones competing among us themselves, the main problem with most birds is that because birds need to fly, they can only lay or produce one egg at a time. This is something that is like the foundation biology of birds. So they produce one egg at a time and they lay it as soon as possible so that they become lighter and they're able to fly. Now, that brings a problem because it means that they will be laying eggs at different intervals. And inevitably, the older chicks will hatch earlier and will become stronger and the younger chicks will be hatched uh, a little bit later. So what happens is that the active siblicide is where one chick is killing the other chick. And this is something that happens in birds of prey as well as other birds as well. It's not just unique to birds of prey. And then we have passive siblicide, which is basically that the older chick is competing uh, for food and other resources that the parents bring back and trying to outdo the younger chick. So this is something that is common uh, in most birds. And I would say as long as there's that interval, like in ospreys, there's often a big interval between the younger chick and the oldest chick, and there will often be competition uh, for resources. Yeah, that happens a lot. Excellent. Uh, great. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, ben, good to see you, Ben, online. That's fantastic. Uh, Washington, I hope you are ready for a very, very uh, in-depth question here from Ben. Um, he says, oh, great talks, thanks. Uh, it was said that fish eagle breeding attempts are triggered when water level is low. Could sudden unexpected drops in water level lead to out-of-season slash spontaneous breeding attempts? Or uh, is fish eagle breeding somewhat seasonal, uh, season dependent? That's the first part of the question. So uh, the second part of the question is furthermore, do you see clear differences in prey species captured between fish eagle and ospreys? And do you think this is due to different hunting strategies? Oh, wow, that's a really in-depth one. <laughs> I will do my best to try and answer that. Uh, yes, so number one that you need to know is um, fish eagles have two factors to think about, uh, which I mentioned during my uh, talk earlier. Number one is food availability, and number two would be the habitat where they need to put the nest. So that means big trees and good shorelines uh, for them to put their big nests. Now, number one, where it comes to food, due to fluctuation of water levels in different lakes. Sometimes when the water levels are good, it means also the fish production is good. And that's why we've seen sometimes in Lake Naivasha to be particular, that when we have more water or uh, uh, the lake is quite swollen, we get more fish eagles uh, getting easier food at that time. Uh, now, it also presses on to availability of uh, uh, shoreline. So when the water is high, it basically means it's expanding the shoreline. And that means even territories that were tight and where there was a bit of uh, close proximity, then an extra territory can be formed. And that would mean that when the water levels are high, extra territories get formed because there's more beachfront now uh, and there's more places for the nests to be put. So that is one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is, seasonal fluctuations based on uh, weather across a, a year or an annual calendar. Uh, and this would help in this way. When the water is slow in the dry season, you would find more eagles wanting to breed, but they're only breeding more because they're able to see more fish. 
because when the water is shallow, they can see quickly, they can see where the fish is and they can be able to pick it up quickly. Uh, the same thing happens with the owls, like pearls fishing owls, when the water levels are low, they will be able to hunt more. Now, this does not mean a total change in water surface area, because like now with the Rift Valley, we've been having seasons where I think every five years, the lakes expand and then the lakes contract a little bit and then expand again in continuous cycles. So within those cycles, we are going to have more fish eagles because there's more space for territories. Competition is reducing. However, in a calendar, within the five years, as much as things are changing, in a calendar from January to December, we have dry seasons and wet seasons uh, that are influenced by uh, the weather. So that will mean that we have times when the lake is actually easier to hunt, and we have times when the lake is difficult to hunt. And whether there is a continuous rise or a continuous uh, lowering of the shoreline, when the water is clear, then the fish will be able to be uh, more visible for the eagles and the owls. And that's why I mentioned that during the drier months, you get more hunting. But in general, the more the lakes are rising, the more the fish eagle population is expanding. It's a bit complex there, uh, but I hope I'm able to uh, explain it well. Now, on the different uh, diet uh, types, yes, the owls, uh, I mean, the osprey, sorry, would be able to get more fish uh, related food because they are diving uh, technique. They mainly depend on that diving technique. Uh, and as we've learned during today's talk is that the ospreys will often submerge. Most of the time when they are hunting, they submerge in more of like a collapse. It's more like an accidental hunt. So most of their hunts are actually more like a controlled incident of an accident that was about to happen in the water, but they do succeed many, many times. Uh, whereas the fish eagles will be more particular. They are more accurate, I would say, because lots of the time the fish eagle does not go underwater. Most of the time it picks the prey right above the surface there or just below the surface and then moves along. So we find that the fish eagle now is able to hunt other animals that don't need to be underwater. And a good example which I gave is the red knobbed coots, which I've seen a lot of, uh, and flamingos. They love to catch flamingos. And one advantage of catching flamingos is because flamingos take a long time before they fly. They are big birds with long legs and very weak uh, flight. So before flamingo takes to the air, it often runs on the water's edge or on the water surface, and then now takes off and starts flying. By the time it's struggling with all this, we are dealing with a fish eagle that is super fast and able to swoop in very quickly. And often they pick the flamingos before they can take to air. So that's one of the differences where the flamingos and the coots and all these other uh, surface animals would fit the fish eagle more, whereas the submerged individuals like the big fish would fit the osprey more. I hope I was able to touch on both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that was really well answered, Washington. And uh, Ben, thank you for that uh, for that question. Uh, he's a Ben is a is a fellow Fitzpatrick uh, researcher. Actually, he's a he's an honorary uh, raptor raptor biologist. Um, so yeah, I did expect quite a, <laughs> a complex question from him. Um, we. We've got a we've got another question from Walter. Um, he says in Lake Naivasha, there's tourism activity and fishing is thrown uh, towards the direction of African fish eagles, where they can get it easily. Uh, assume tourism stops or boat riders stop throwing the fish for the eagles. Do you think the hunting skills of the eagles are tampered or interfered with? Um, I think that that's in relation to what what Simon mentioned about. Um, the, the fish eagles capitalizing on the, that tourism activity. Um, you want to give it a shot answer, answering that, Washington? Yes, um, uh, yeah, that's true. Um, and it's not only on Lake Naivasha, it's also happening on uh, Lake Baringo. Um, and I would expect the same to be happening in other lakes or wetlands across the continent. So yes, when we feed the fish eagles, uh, it's a technique that is uh, done by tour guides to be able to entertain the tourists. But as Simon mentioned, it's an advantage also to the eagles. Uh, and data and science has proven that the fish eagles that are being uh, sent or thrown <laughs> fish at are actually breeding better because of that extra or supplemented fish. Now, I do not expect them to stop because if you remember from my talk, I mentioned from my own personal observations, and this is something you can observe on the ground, if an eagle had eaten that day, they wouldn't come for a second fish. 
Uh, and the ego having eaten that day can be from two scenarios. Either, uh, and this happens a lot to me because I do move with uh, tour groups to these lakes. If another tour group had gone ahead of us and thrown a fish, the fish ego will not come for the second boat. Now, that only changes if they have a partner that they want to impress so they can pick the fish and take it to the partner or if they have chicks in the nest. So they'll pick the fish and take it to the chicks and they will be ready for a second fish. But that means that the second scenario is the most important. Now, there are fish uh, eagles that will have hunted on their own before we get to the lake with our boats. So when they have hunted on their own, they don't come for our fish because by that time they are well fed. And a good example is I have personally noticed, it's not yet scientifically done, uh, but just by observation, I have noticed that in the afternoons, the fish eagles are less responsive or they take longer, but in the mornings they are quite responsive. So this might explain that if you go early morning, they have not yet started fishing because fish eagles are diano hunters. They don't hunt uh, predominantly at night. They will hunt predominantly during the day. So that means if you are very early in the morning, you'll be able to get them when they're hungry and they will accept your fish quickly. If you go in the afternoon, even if somebody else hasn't thrown a fish at them, when they get hungry during the day, they will hunt on their own. So that means if you go too late in the afternoon, they will not pick your fish and they will not be interested. So I think even if we were to stop throwing fish at these eagles, uh, they would still be okay and they would still be able to hunt because the technique is still there. These eagles are able to still see where you throw your fish. They're able to still come and pick it off the surface, the same technique they would use for a live fish. So I think they would still survive. All right. That's a, that's very interesting uh, that you mentioned that actually um, is is the fish uh, from my side at least Washington the fish that the that these individuals are are feeding um, what fish are they are they locally caught from that lake or is it sardines for example t- bought from a fishing shop you know that's always it's always a concern of mine personally uh, is is that that supplemental or artificial feeding of raptors um, especially when it comes to things that they're not supposed to be eating uh, on a regular basis so what fish do you know what fish they they're actually feeding these these raptors Uh Yes, that's a really good question, uh, because actually that ties in again to the point that I said, these eagles are still practicing catching the fish they would practice on if these fish eagles were not being fed. Because the guys who are doing the tourism and who are doing the throwing of all these uh, fish items, they pick or buy the fish from the local fishermen. So I have personally seen them do that. So they wait for the local fishermen to bring the boats on board. And when they come to the shoreline, they buy fish from them and then they use those to throw to the fish. So like in uh, Lake Naivasha, the main one is tilapia, uh, the Nile tilapia, which is really common. Uh, I've also seen them throw common cup uh, and Miracap. Those are the three main uh, fish uh, species I've seen. Uh, in Lake Baringo, I've also seen them throw a barb species, which is sometimes nicknamed the Lake Baringo barb. So those are the uh, likely fish, and those are the fish items and species that are still within these lakes. So it's good for them because also the fish eagles are practicing uh, with a type of fish that they would naturally catch in the same lakes. Yeah. So they are not from elsewhere. Fantastic. Well, that's that that at least that is good news. That's fantastic. Excellent. I think we've, we've come to to the end of all those questions. That's fantastic. Uh, I think we go, we're going to end it off there tonight. Um, Washington, uh, thank you so much for your time, for all your information. Um, it's been fantastic. To all our other speakers, thank you so much. Um, our audience members, it's, it's always a pleasure to have you guys here and interact with you all. Um, please remember that uh, that poster that you would have received on your email. Again, free, uh, copyright free and available to you guys to to print, download, um, share. So share it on all your your social media. Um, Let's let's get that information out there uh, and and start assisting in the conservation of these amazing African predators. 